I will be reading Romans 10, 13 and page 1135 in the Pew Bible. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You may be seated. It really is as simple as that. Calling upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. But we tend to make it so, so difficult for people to find that way to faith. We as a people, down through the years, have made rules and regulations and stipulations and, and uh, all sorts of hoops for people to jump through to become people of faith. Well, before you can join the church or before you can be saved, you've got to stop doing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you've got to start doing H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Now, once you've got that down, you come back and talk to me, and we'll talk about joining the church, or we'll talk about being a Christian. But the kids just got finished singing and our scripture was just read. The simplicity of the truth. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. There's no hoops to jump through. No promises to have to make. No expectations to be kept for that moment to come to fruition in your life. As I've said most of the weeks as we've gone through this Roman Road series, is that most of you know that. Okay? This series is to help equip you with courage and strength to be able to share the simplicity of the gospel. Oh, I could never evangelize. Oh, I, I could never share the gospel. Oh, that's somebody else's job. I, I, I'm too shy. I'm too nervous. Uh, I'm not good enough. All excuses that we make up. Because the truth of the matter is simply, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We have an assurance of that. Jesus said so. The Bible speaks its truth. There is a blessed assurance. Now what's an assurance? An assurance is the ability to hold on to something as real and true. Even though you may not understand it. Even though it may not make sense. Even, even though... It may not seem real. Just by a show of hands, who can, uh, in a very simplistic way, explain the theory of relativity to our congregation this morning? Anybody? <laughs> we could use some E equals MC squared. Okay. Most people still wouldn't get that. But that's how the world around us works. That's the, that's the perfection that God put into activity when he created the world. It took Einstein to make some sense out of it that really he and probably a handful of others have ever truly understood. But we have an assurance because of physics and faith that the sun's going to rise tomorrow. And that we're going to wake up. And that if the sun doesn't rise or we don't wake up, we'll be in a better place. Because we've called upon the name of the Lord. And we've been saved. We have that assurance 1 John 5, 13 and 14 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know, that you may have an assurance that you have eternal life. 
This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. It is absolutely 100% God's will that people call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. I believe that that is available to everyone on the face of the earth. Not just a select few, not just those hand-picked special people, but everyone and anyone has the ability and right and privilege to call upon the name of the Lord. It is God's will that humanity is saved. Now that's a simplicity of the scripture which, which you all can share with others. So with that assurance, we also have hope. What is hope? Hope is holding on to something, again, that, that we may not fully grasp. One of the things i found since I've had my stroke, um, uh, things fall out of my hand very easily. Okay, you know, I'll be holding the glass and it'll just slip right out. Something with tactile pressure or my grip, I don't know. Sometimes we, we don't have things very fully grasped in our hand, but we have hope. We know that it's there. We know we can rely on it. We know we can believe in it. Because God's word assures us of the truth. God's word assures us that it's all right to have hope. In Psalm 39, second half of verse 5 on through verse 7 says, Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Psalmist is saying right off, just because somebody looks confident, just because it seems that they have their act together, it doesn't mean they do. Everyone is but a breath. Surely everyone goes around like a phantom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. That's how the world works. That's what the world tries to put their hope in. Status privilege, money. But the psalmist says this in verse 7, but now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. I can have all the money in the world or none at all. I can have all the prestige in the world or none at all. I can have all the power in the world or none at all. Where do I put my hope? I put my hope in God. Because his word says, that's what I'm supposed to do. And if his word says it, I believe it. And I can hold on to it. And it may not, it may not feel real right now in my life. It may not be evidenced right now in my life. I might be in the midst of a terrible trial right now in my life. But I have a truth to hold on to. That will supersede this trial I'm going through. That will last beyond this difficulty that I'm faced with. And that is faith and hope and assurance and peace. Peace that we can hold on to because God's word says it's available to us. Let's say you're going through your cupboards at home and you realize you're out of bread and you want a sandwich. Okay? And you go, oh, I'm out of bread and I want a sandwich. What am I going to do? And you go sit down on the couch for an hour and then you go back to your cupboard and you look in your cupboard and what do you find? You're still out of bread. What do you have to do? You have to get up and you have to go get it. You have to go find it. 
It's there. But you have to work toward it and then grasp hold of it to possess it. And really, that's what God's peace is. See, God puts his peace up here and he says, it's there for you, but you through faith have to take hold of it. You've got to move toward it. You've got to show that you believe in it. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And what? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That is an active pursuit of something. It is doing something to obtain something, to hold on to something. And that's where we get peace that bread's not going to appear in your counter I mean on your counter or in your cupboard you have to go get it and the same thing with peace we have an assurance and a hope in God's word that peace is available and God says go after it when we go after it and we obtain it we have freedom For all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. In that there is freedom. Remember the imagery that we use so often about Jesus and his atonement. What, what does he do? He goes and takes our place. We are in shackles and we are bound and we are before the judge, ready to be judged and out of the blue in through the door comes Jesus. And everybody turns around and the whole courtroom gets quiet. And, and he comes through and he pushes through the swinging gate. And he says, Your Honor, this man is guilty. And he deserves to die. But I have come to die in his place that he might live. And the bailiffs come and they take the shackles off my hands and off my feet. And they say, what? You're free. Go. Remember the prostitute in the Gospels who was caught in the midst of adultery? And she's dragged out forcibly by these religious men to be stoned. And Jesus happens up and what? Walks through the swinging gate and says, you're right, she's guilty. And the law says she must die. Here you go. You who are without sin, cast the first stone. I, I'm, I'm going to step back here. Go ahead, she's right there. I can imagine her going, what are you doing? What are you doing? They're going to they're gonna stone me. And you, you start to hear stones drop. And no doubt she's cowering, say, boy, they're bad aim, but one's going to hit me soon. And after a minute, she looks up and she sees this perimeter all around her, stones lying on the ground. And men walking away. And Jesus says, where, where, where are your accusers? They're gone. Then I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. Her, her shackles were removed from her hands and her feet. And she walked out a free woman. That's where we find our freedom. We find our freedom in Christ. And that's what we want to share with others when we're sharing the gospel. Is the simplicity. The simplicity of God's word. For all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And with that salvation comes an assurance. And a peace. And a hope. And freedom.
2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom from your past. Well, I cheated on my wife, or I was addicted to alcohol, or, or I used to steal from, from the store, or... Uh, I didn't take other people's feelings into consideration. Or I, I used to yell and scream at mom when I was a kid. Anywhere along that spectrum of sin. God's telling us this morning that there is freedom. The only way that you are tied to that previous sin is if you come back and you take that handcuff up again and you put it back on your own wrist and connect it to that sin. God will not do that. So often we come back to our sin as a dog returns to its vomit. Not a pleasant picture. But if you've ever seen a dog throw up, what do they do? They go back and eat it. Why do we do that? Because when we are saved, we forget to trust and hope and believe and be free. Now that doesn't mean the moment that you're saved that your addiction will be miraculously gone. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. It doesn't mean that the moment you're, you're saved that your anger management issues will miraculously disappear. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. If they do, praise God. And watch out because something else is coming your way. If they don't, trust Him. Have that assurance in Him, knowing that He will walk with you. And the only thing that's going to slow you down in your recovery from sin is when you shackle yourself back up to that vomit of your own sin. And basically what you're telling God is, God, your sacrifice isn't good enough for me. I don't deserve it, or I don't want it. What I'm asking you all today to do is to believe. Believe that God can take you from where you are today as a believer in Him to a better place tomorrow, and to a much better place a week, a month, and a year from now. And then I'm asking you to share. Share with others the truth of the gospel. Share with others the simplicity of our scripture this morning. All you need to do is call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. And the last you say, well, what does it mean to be saved? And then you go, oh my gosh, now I've got to define something. I, I really don't know how to explain that. Sure you do, it's simple. What it means is that God takes your sin away from you. That you might be free from it. Because he loves you that much. And then just let that sink into a person's heart. They may not fall on their knees that very moment and, and, and with tears in their eyes confess Jesus as Lord. But you know what? If you plant that simplistic seed in the heart of a believer, a, an unbeliever, God will bring that seed to, to, to life and to fullness and to blossom. We had 75, 80 kids this week through Vacation Bible School. Okay. What did we do? We planted seeds.
And there will be children who become teenagers or even adults. And in their life, that seed will burst forth in fullness. And they will say, I believe. They may not be able to pin it back to the Vacation Bible School song. Okay? Or to a particular teacher. Or a submarine snack made out of Twinkie. But they will know somewhere that somehow they knew that. I don't know how I knew that, but I knew it. And now I believe it. And I'm saved. What a day of rejoicing that will be in heaven. The chorus of angels will scream in adulation because that person was saved. And God might, every once in a while, God does this just to keep us connected. He might bring us back across that path and somebody will say, Miss Cindy, I remember you. You were my VBS leader. And I'm a Christian because of what you shared with me in Vacation Bible School 12 years ago. And then we cry. Gosh, what a blessing that is to share God's Word. Remember, that's what this sermon series is about. That the blessing we can receive by sharing God's Word with others. You don't have to be an evangelist. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to be an adult. You just simply have to have the truth in your life. If you have the truth in your life, you can share the truth with others. Amen.